Hello, Penguin Arts. I'm the Vidi Penguin, and welcome to Kerbal Space Program for All Kerbal Kind, a brand new competitive career mode series in collaboration with N9 Gaming. And as you can see behind our three illustrious Kerbonauts here, we are in the Realism Overhaul with the Real Scale Solar System, RP1 Realistic Progression, Kerbalism, and a whole host of mods. The mod list is about as long as my arm, and you will find it in the description below. If you watched my my space race series with tape gaming back in the day you'll have a vague idea of how this series is going to work essentially myself and n9 are going to be in a space race he will be playing as the united states of america and i will be playing as the union of soviet socialist republics john f kerman of course has not made his famous we choose to go to the moon speech just yet as we are starting in 1951 however Werner von kerman and sergey kerman the respective heads of our space programs know that the moon is the goal by which each respective nation will test their strengths. But without any further ado, let's head straight into the game. It's the early hours of the morning here in the Kaputnik Design Bureau here at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. And you will see that the simple addition of Kerbal Construction Time has completely negated the need for any rules or turn-based systems like we had back in Space Race. This series is going to work a lot more smoothly than that one did. But you'll see here we have two free upgrade points that we begin our campaign with. So we're immediately just going to stick one into the VAB over here and then one into the space plane hangar. As you can see, it upgrades our build rate significantly, uh, otherwise it would take about five years to build a single craft. Then I think what we're gonna do is just spend some of our initial funds here because uh, we actually start with a, well, a fair bit of initial funding injected into our program, although of course, you know, space isn't exactly the goal as of yet <laughs> especially here in kaputnik we're having to develop things with military applications first and then if they happen to have space applications well that's just an added bonus but i think we will stick another point here into the vab because that's where we're going to be spending the majority of our time uh, in the coming few episodes now we'll just head over to the mission control building where we have ourselves the first launch contract which we will accept and now we'll head over into the space plane hangar and the VAB respectively and get some craft building because we don't want to be wasting a single minute. We want to be building craft in the space plane hangar and in the vehicle assembly building at pretty much all times, pushing on all cylinders to get our Kerbals up into space before our competition. Whoa, what's this? Biddy's doing a building time lapse. Well, a fair few of you have been requesting these in my other Kerbal videos, and I thought it'd be quite important to do these in Realism Overhaul because the way you build craft is, well, very, very different to the stock game. And of course, the parts we begin with are also very different. No starting with manned capsules. No, we are beginning with very, very simple sounding rockets, which don't even have uh, sophisticated enough avionics to fully control them. We're just going to be simply spin stabilizing this first little launcher here called the R1 Boomstick, which is a sort of naming convention I thought I would go with, where we have the official name and then we have the nickname that the engineers actually building it give to it. And as you can see, yeah, this thing is absolutely titchy see, compared to all the uh, little Kerbal engineers running around in the vehicle assembly building, powered by the ORM65 rocket engine, which is really underpowered. I mean, this engine was designed in 1936 for the RP318 rocket plane. This is a pre-war engine and it shows. Its thrust to weight ratio is abysmal. And this is a, actually an area where N9 has a bit of an advantage over me. He has access to the Aerobe rocket engine, which is really pretty good early sounding rocket engine um, for a smaller sort of sounding rockets. Yeah, uh, this is barely going to make 35 kilometers. And you see we have to mount a pretty large solid kick stage onto it just to whack it up into the sky because its thrust to weight ratio is barely over one. You see there having to tool the uh, procedural parts that we're using, which is actually a mechanic in RP1 where you have to actually pay to but essentially produce the manufacturing equipment necessary to create the procedural parts. Think of it as essentially the buy-in cost of the part, you know, when you research things in the R&D building except for procedural parts. But here we are, the Baikonur Cosmodrome, although not actually called the Baikonur Cosmodrome. It was originally only named that just to uh, <laughs> to keep its true location a secret from the West and their spies. 
but the 14th of March, and we are testing our very first rocket. Launching it straight into the air using that tiny tin booster, and then just before it flames out, decoupling the upper stage, and there we go. We are heading into the sky towards space and towards glory for the Soviet Union. Although, of course, we're not going to get anywhere near space. <laughs> this is the largest rocket I could build supported by this rocket engine. With regard to limiting ourselves to US or Soviet technology, we're only doing it with command pods and with liquid-fueled rocket engines. But not even all of the liquid-fueled rocket engines, right? Because there aren't always... Um, enough alternatives, well, Soviet alternatives to certain engines in the tech tree, um, and that would actually give N9 an unfair advantage. So I'm allowed to use the XLR11 engine, because otherwise I just wouldn't be able to build X-planes, right? And that would <laughs> that would really give N9 a bit of an unfair uh, advantage. But a little bit later on, we'll have more than enough alternatives. And uh, it, it leads to some quite interesting things, actually, because, of course, I'll not have access to a lot of um, hydrolox engines, a lot of very efficient hydrogen, liquid oxygen upper stages. Um, but I will have access to, you know, stage combustion engines way before N9 gets access to them. So we'll have sort of differing, uh, different approaches to our launch vehicles. Um, which I think should be really, really pretty interesting. With regard to the craft we're building in this series, we're not building exact replica craft, right? Um, we are going to be mimicking mission profiles, and I'll certainly, you know, make all of my rockets look very distinctively Soviet. We'll definitely create an R7 uh, recreation at some point, um, but we're not just exclusively limiting ourselves to historical launches and to historical spacecraft. But, all in all, that was a pretty successful first flight. Didn't really make it all that far, but all we really needed it to do was get us a bit of scientific data, a bit of flight data as well for that engine to make it more reliable, because engine failures are something we're going to have to deal with in this series, and it gives us access to a bunch more contracts. We can grab ourselves the X-Planes Low contract and the Carmen Line contract, um, as well as a low-sounding rocket contract as well. So all for our next few missions. We then also head over into the R&D center and get ourselves post-war rocketry testing researching, which will give us access to as well as the XLR-11 engine, which is very, very useful for rocket planes. We'll also get the RD-101 upgrade to the RD-100 engine, but we're not using that just yet. First of all, we are, as you can see, designing ourselves a very, very simple little aircraft. Now, I actually designed this aircraft um, and got it building before I launched the R-1 there, because as I said earlier, we want to have craft built in the VAB and in the space plane hangar at pretty much all times, uh, as I said, firing on all cylinders. But I thought I would uh, put the building time lapse um, just before we actually launch the craft so that the timeline doesn't start getting a little bit confusing. Hopefully that makes a bit of sense. You see there using, uh, using the colouring UI to make the aircraft look rather beautiful with its red control surfaces. I did end up deciding against it simply because we can't recolor everything we can recolor the procedural parts um and a number of the fuel tanks and things but we can't recolor the actual command pods and a lot of the engines and things so since the command pod is stock white and stock black i ended up uh, <laughs> ended up changing the color scheme you can see here fully procedural um, control surfaces, wings, fuel tanks, we really are being rather spoiled. We're not actually using a Russian engine. I don't believe we had access to any Russian uh, piston engines. As I said, um, it's only it's only liquid fuel rocket engines where we're actually limiting ourselves. Um, but that will create, you know, more than enough diversity in our launch vehicles, as well as the fact that, you know, I'm sure we're going to be designing things very differently anyway. Uh, but we're actually using a Merlin engine, not just because I'm British, but the Soviets had access to Merlin engines. Um, they received a fair few Spitfires during Lend-Lease, which is uh, quite interesting. Although, fun fact, the... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, the Soviets really did not like the Spitfire, mainly because they got them without manuals. Like right? They had to figure them out themselves. Uh, and it's not the easiest aircraft to fly, so uh, they really didn't actually use them that extensively, although, as I said, they did have access to them. And they're certainly no stranger to uh, using British engines, especially with regard to British jet engines. Um, that is a story which really annoys me, but <laughs> uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we actually create some jet aircraft in future episodes. There's not much point building a jet aircraft at this point, because jet engines are expensive, and we only have access to the Meteor engines, so we wouldn't be able to break the sound barrier with it, and honestly, yeah, uh, 
with the use of aircraft, right, we want to be able to just get up to altitude and do some science experiments and break some altitude records. There isn't much that a jet aircraft could do over this very, very simple little piston aircraft. Um, so I'm not really going to waste my money or time actually producing them. But you can see there, there we go, we've actually manufactured it. And we end up launching it on the same day, a few hours later than the R1, which I found rather amusing. We just called it the uh, KPNK, standing for Kaputnik, of course, the name of our design bureau. KPNK1 Babushka, because it is just an adorable little <laughs> simple prop plane. Being flown here by Vladimir Kerman, named after Vladimir Ilyushin, who was an honored test pilot of the USSR. I've renamed all of our starting Kerbals, uh, and so has N9, I believe, and I'll be naming them after actual historical figures. So it gives me something to talk about. Uh, we haven't named any of them after actual Soviet cosmonauts because thanks to, I think it's Kerbalism, our Kerbals actually retire and I think they're all going to be retiring in 1957, which is well before we'll be launching any of them into space, right? So I didn't want to name any of them like Yuri, Kerman or anything. I want to save that uh, save a few names <laughs> for when we're actually launching Kerbals up into space, but that will not be for uh, quite some time yet. But as you can see here, we're just doing a few sort of lazy laps of the space center. And uh, in the top right, you can see Kerbalism doing its magic because Kerbalism, as well as adding a whole host of things like life support, radiation, um, it has like coronal mass ejections as well, which is pretty terrifying. <laughs> we enabled those, which, uh, yeah, if you look at how lucky the Apollo missions were, you look at coronal mass ejections and then the dates of the Apollo missions, they were so lucky to avoid them, right? Because <laughs> they, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't have killed them outright, but it would have seriously caused some health complications uh, for those astronauts. They really, really did narrowly avoid um, getting, well, lots of cancer, <laughs> I guess. Uh, but you can see science experiments are changed by Kerbalism in a way as well, which is actually, I really like. I really like the Kerbalism science system. Science experiments take a long time to do. Um, you have to sometimes do them over multiple flights to actually get the maximum amount of science. And it means you have to actually, you know, keep satellites in orbit for long periods of time. You can't just nip into a biome for a split second and immediately get all the science, right? Um, and it also just means you can leave the science experiments running and they will just collect data, right? I don't have to continuously keep my eye on a science alert window popping up and, you know, try and click the experiments as fast as possible. It doesn't work like that. It's a continuous stream of data. It's more realistic and honestly, I think it is great. You see there, we actually completed our uh, X-plane contract. We just had to hold an altitude for a certain amount of time. And now we're going to see if we can break 10 kilometers and just get that manned altitude milestone uh, achievement. Although, I mean, it's not really going to be a world milestone, is it? Because World War II just happened and <laughs> definitely had some more sophisticated aircraft than this little, uh, this crappy little test plane. Um, but apparently milestones within our space program still net us some funds, so we're going to try for it anyway. And unfortunately, yeah, I barely put any fuel onto this thing since it was just supposed to do a few laps of the space center and get a bit of science. Um, I wasn't intending to try and go for 10 kilometers. I didn't think a plane this simple could actually even get near it. And unfortunately, we got infuriatingly close to 10 kilometers, but we didn't quite make it. So we're going to have to uh, glide back down to the runway. Of course, this being a very, very nerve-wracking uh, thing, <laughs> every landing is going to be, because uh, save reverting and quick save loading is completely banned, right? If we make a mistake at any point throughout this series, if we have a launch failure or anything, we have to stick with it, which is uh, certainly making things more exciting, and it means I'm actually going to have to put abort systems on my spacecraft. For the first time ever, I never put abort systems on my spacecraft. If something goes wrong, you know, in the past I've just reverted. Um, it's certainly a more nerve-wracking way of playing, but it does make things a lot more exciting. But to make things, you know, less terrifying, especially for me being, uh, being relatively new to realism overhaul, we've made simulations absolutely free, right? We've got the K-R-A-S-H, or Crash, simulation mod. So we can do simulations of all of our craft. Um, so we've made those completely free, not not custom, costing any funds. So we can simulate things to high heaven, right? As much as I want to, to ensure that my actual designs are fine. But then if anything goes wrong on the actual mission, then we have to stick with it. Uh, we thought that was a pretty good balance. You see there, we get loads of science just from having recovered a vessel that survived a flight. And now we can go queue up a 
bunch of text to be researched in our R&D center. But those will, of course, take time, thanks to Kerbal Construction Time. But we're going to grab ourselves supersonic plane development so we can get working on some X-planes in the next episode. Uh, and then we're going to get working on post-war material science. We get some better fuel tanks, early tracking systems, so better avionics, and then early rocketry to so get some even more sophisticated rocket engines. I believe we get the RD-102 uh, upgrade for our RD100 series liquid fueled engines. Then we're just going to grab ourselves another X planes, low contract, and uh, we're actually going to put another point into our R and D. Actually, it might be the first point in our R and D actually, because <laughs> we have uh, a fair few funds to play it with now, uh, and just want to get that at R and D center working away. You know. <laughs> Get working, eggheads. We need ourselves some more sophisticated rocket engines. But in the meantime, we're just going to send up the Babushka again, this time with a different pilot. We're using Raphael Kerman, who's named after Raphael Cap Caprelian. Caprelian, is that how you pronounce that? I'm probably going to be butchering a lot of Russian names in this series. Uh, he was actually a hero of the Soviet Union, um, and he was actually a test pilot on the, the Tu-4 which was, well, the Tupolev, yeah, Tupolev Tu-4, which was a Soviet copy of the Russian B-29 Super Fortress, um, which does actually play a part since uh, Kerbal Construction Time actually adds an air launch capability. Because, of course, well, if you're building X-planes and stuff, you don't want to be launching them from the ground. You want to be launching them from the wing of a large aircraft. But if you have to build the huge aircraft to drop it as well, it's going to take ages. So it actually introduces an air launch capability. Um, and, of course, we wouldn't be launching our X-planes <laughs> from the wing of a B-29. It would definitely be from a from a Tupolev Tu-4. So, uh, yeah, Raphael being, being here does certainly play a part. So we'll do our best not to, well, you know, kill him <laughs> on his first flight. I was very careful to you know add flaps and everything and uh, well my actual experience on my course is actually coming into play here uh, especially using um, Ferrum Aerospace changing the aerodynamics model but also giving us a bunch of aerodynamic derivatives for our aircraft and having now done an air aerodynamics and flight mechanics module on my course I actually know what they all mean so it was certainly making me happy and nine said that he just uh, he presses the button and if they're all green all the numbers are green then he, <laughs> he just goes yep that's fine uh, but actually having some numbers to work with in kerbal um yeah it's making things a lot easier so even though realism overhaul is obviously a lot more complicated you're given a lot more tools to make things uh, make things more manageable, which I think is great. One tool we're not using though is MechJeb. You'll notice the lack of MechJeb because I hate MechJeb, right? And I'm sure many of you are going to be a little annoyed by this. And there's nothing wrong, you know, if you personally enjoy using you know, Kerbal operating system, MechJeb, and all of that. It depends what you get out of Kerbal, right? A lot of people just want to build a craft and then get some beautiful shots of it launching into orbit and have just their missions go off absolutely flawlessly, right? And just essentially just create the sort of cinematics themselves. And they find all the fun in just designing and planning the mission. That's fine. That is absolutely fine. But I hate <laughs> any mod that flies your missions for you because... The fun of Kerbal is flying the missions, right? Um, I I know I would be able to launch things way more efficiently if we had Mech Jeb, um, but I just I, it was one thing that I just wouldn't <laughs> back off on. But then and I was like, no, we are not using Mech Jeb. We're gonna get. Kerbal Engineer, as you see, we have Kerbal Engineer up for all the extra information. We have a precise maneuver node editor, a bunch of tools, um, which you obviously, you, know, you really need to pull things off uh, with all the added complexity of realism overhaul. But MechJeb is one thing that I stood my ground on. I, I hate MechJeb. Um, so <laughs> I'm sure I've annoyed some people saying that, but, uh, but we will not be using it in this series. I think it's a lot more exciting to be manually flying our own spacecraft. You see there we get uh, some more science, get some more funds, and there we go. We have completed our second flight of the Babushka. Flight of the Babushka. Sounds like a piece of Russian classical music, doesn't it? I'm thinking of Flight of the Bumblebee. <laughs> but as you can see there, we have finished researching our post-war rocketry testing and unlocked the XLR-11 rocket engine, but we won't be able to build any X-planes until we have completed our supersonic aircraft development. So in the meantime, we are going to be launching yet another sounding rocket, but this one is going to be a much larger scale. We've grabbed ourselves a contract to actually break the Kármán line, and so we're going to build a rocket capable of doing such a thing. It's going to be pretty similar to a V2 missile. I mean, we're using the RD-100, which really began as a one-to-one -one copy of, I believe it's the A4 rocket engine that powered the V2 missile. So this thing is, is going to look distinctly V2-esque. 
Um, but we are using, as I said, an RD100 engine because we haven't quite uh, actually unlocked the RD101 at the time when I started building this. So although you've just seen me unlock the RD101 engine by completing post-war rocketry testing, we started building this thing uh, ages ago. <laughs> actually, a little earlier on. I started building it as we were rolling out the R1 to the pad because it takes a couple of days to roll rockets out onto the pad and you can get building another rocket in the meantime. So it's still using the RD100 but we'll use the RD101 on our next launch. You can see here just uh, adding a few scientific instruments, a few bits and bobs and yeah this is significantly more powerful than the R1. So we just called it the R2 Carmen because well that's the target that we're going for. Do all of our tooling just to uh, reduce the cost and uh, actually speed up the production of the rocket and we also actually enabled extra pre-flight tests because if this rocket engine fails it is going to set us back a long long way right it's still taking months for us to build simple sounding rockets uh, so we really need this launch to go flawlessly so just uh, spending a bit of extra time a bit of extra funds and uh, getting ourselves some extra pre-flight checking just to increase the reliability of that main engine and the launch goes off without a hitch soaring into the upper atmosphere and across the Kármán line into space. I think this, uh, the green and red sort of design, I think it looks pretty similar actually to some of the very early Soviet sounding rockets. I've actually been reading up on um, the early Soviet ballistic missile tests and everything and uh, I think we've got a pretty decent aesthetic going but oh look at that the number of milestones we're breaking we of course complete our very lucrative Kármán line contract and our low sounding rocket contract we just <laughs> blew it completely out of the water yeah this is a very very profitable launch for us and oh look at that gorgeous view of the planet. Of course, not actually the first man-made object to breach the Kármán line because the Germans actually did that during World War II with the, their own V2 rocket, but still a major milestone for the Soviet space program and I'm sure uh, we'll uh, <laughs> at least be delaying our inevitable vacation to Siberia when uh, Josef Kerman hears of this wonderful success, even if the rocket did uh, disintegrate and explode on re-entry. <laughs> it wasn't really intended to survive re-entry though, but I'm sure on the next episode, we may well design some uh, some nose cones which are actually intended to return. Perhaps even send some biological samples up there to get some more research. But look at that. Even more funds, even more rewards. And now we're going to sink about 180,000 funds into our space program, mainly into the Vehicle Assembly Building and into the R&D Center because, yeah, we really, really need to pick up the pace uh, with launching our sounding rockets and getting our research done as quickly as possible. Then we're just going to grab ourselves a suborbital launch contract, uh, an altitude and payload sounding contract as well. And in the next episode, we will be grabbing ourselves the breaking the sound barrier contract and building some X planes. Although I guess it'd be Ha planes in the Russian alphabet. I'm I probably just butchered that. But either way, that will be in the next episode. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. I do hope you enjoyed. If you want to see what those pesky yanks have been up to during this same time frame, then there will be a link to N9's video in the end screen. N9's videos will be going up at the same time as mine, and they will be going up every fortnight. I know that sounds like quite a while, uh, but such is the nature of these collaborative projects. You'll have a lot of other videos in the meantime, and Beyond Kerbal will also be continuing, so don't be worried about that. Thank you for watching, everyone. I've been the Beardy Penguin, and I will see you all next time.